Okay, so uh, welcome to Ring for Lesion number three. So the topic today is elimination and implicitization. So the setting is that K is a field, which I will take algebraically closed. Algebraically closed field, such as the complex numbers. I'm going to write K x, x bar for the polynomial ring in n variables, x1 up to xn. And I'm going to look at an ideal in the polynomial ring. So associated with this ideal, we can look at the set of zeros. And you learn that that's called a variety. So the variety of the ideal, v of i, is the set of all points p in k to the n such that s of p is equal to 0 for all f and i. OK, um, so now we have a, a geometric object in n-dimensional space. And we can look at its projections into lower dimensional subspaces. So. We're going to do a coordinate projection pi from k to the n to k to the m, where we take a vector. I'm going to spell out the coordinates p1 up to pm, pm plus 1 up to pn. And we simply erase the last n minus m coordinates. So uh, this is a coordinate projection just erasing the last so many coordinates of a point in n-dimensional space. And the first observation is if V is a variety, so if V is a variety in K to the n, well, you would like it that the projection is also a variety. So you'd like to say that the projection is a variety, so pi of v is the image of v under the map. And that's generally not a variety. So it may not be a variety. So just to recap, so the var a variety is a subset of k to the n, which is the zero set by, of a collection of polynomials. That collection of polynomials can be finite or infinite. Because by Hilbert spaces theorem, a posteriori, we can always replace an infinite set of polynomials by a finite subset as the same zero set. So that's what we mean by a variety, just a bunch of zeros of, a, of polynomials. And this may not be true. So for example, uh, let's say, uh, let's do the example here. So the example, if n is equal to 2, and m is equal to 1. And we take the hyperbola. So the hyperbola is the zero set of x times y minus 1. So then that's a variety. That's a quadratic curve in the plane. But the image of this variety under projection just onto the x-coordinate is all points except the origin. Right? So, so the picture is, in this example, pi of v, which is the whole line except for the origin, is not a variety. Um, why is it not a variety? Well, so here's the hyperbola. We project. So here's the picture. We get every point except for the origin. Well, if um, k minus 0 were a variety, then there exists some polynomial of which this is the 0 set. But uh, well, a polynomial that vanishes at infinite many points in k must be the zero polynomial. So k is an algebraically closed field. In particular, it's an infinite field. And as such, any polynomial that vanishes on the set must be the zero polynomial. But then 
The zero point normal has a variety, that's the whole line. Right? So therefore, ripping out one or few points will leave you with a non-variety. So how can we fix this? That is the uh, notion of closure that we use here. So this is called the Zariski closure. Named after Oskar Zariski, geometer from nearly 100 years ago. So the Zariski closure, let me say, uh, call it W bar of any subset. So you have W as a subset, let's say, of K to the M. By definition, is the smallest variety. Is the smallest variety among all those that contain W. Among all varieties containing W. So closure sounds like topology, and indeed it is a topology. So there is a Zariski topology, and in the Zariski topology, the closed sets are the varieties, open sets are complements of varieties. A very coarse topology doesn't have as many open sets as the usual calculus topology you're familiar with when K is R or C, but uh, it's very convenient when you speak about algebraic objects to speak about Zariski topology, and surprisingly often in applications, those two closures will agree. Okay, so it contains, so the Zariski closure of a set always contains the classical closure, And by classical closure, I, I mean the usual to closure if the field is the real or complex numbers. Um, however, in general, the Zwiski closure is smaller, right? So, so let's say we're in the situation where W is on the line, it's the open interval from zero to one. So on the real line, let's say, or possibly even the complex plane, so if you have the open interval from zero to one, the closure in the usual strong topology is the closed interval from zero to one, but in the risky topology, it's all of K1, right? And uh, let me write it like this, so W bar is all of K1, and again, for the same reason. If you have any polynomial that vanishes on the whole open interval, that means it vanishes at infinitely many points, and then a polynomial in one variable that in vanishes at infinitely many points has to be the zero polynomial. Okay, so here's our first theorem. So suppose I is an ideal in n variables. And as before, I'm going to write V, V of I, its variety. Its variety. <clears throat> then, by the closed image, so I'm going to sneak in a definition. So by closed image, I will mean the closure of the image. So Pi of V is the image of this variety just under projection into m-dimensional space. And then by closed image, I will mean the risky closure of the image. Well, so this is a variety by definition. Right? So risky closure is a variety. So if it's a variety, what is its ideal? Right? So if you're a variety, then you have a defining ideal. In fact, you have a unique radical ideal, as we shall see, that defines you. And uh, this is given by the elimination ideal. So the elimination ideal, again, this is a definition. Let's call it J. Is I intersected with the subalgebra, the subpolynomial ring generated by the first M variables? So if I is an ideal in the big polynomial ring, then the intersection with the subring is also an ideal. You check the axioms for being an ideal. 
as such, it has a variety in m-dimensional space, and that variety in m-dimensional space is the smallest variety containing pi of v. No, I'm not. You're good? Okay. Okay, so the proof of this, um, I'm gonna refer to, again, the undergraduate textbook by Cox Loche, so CLO is Cox Loche, and this is theorem three in section 2.2. So closure of the image, except for this closure business, image is elimination. Now this is actually true in many settings, so let me step back and make a general remark. So the geometric operation in any context actually of projection corresponds on the algebra side to elimination to the algebraic operation of elimination. So projection and elimination are really the same, right? So question? Um, if um, this is true, I, I want to understand where are the um, uh, those elements which are in the boundary of that closure. Ah, okay. Because um, according to that example, we see that the projection is not the same, mm -hmm. uh, the projection is not variety. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, um, the correspondence uh, is not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Does it mean exactly the same? Exactly, because so the, there, are, there are some points missing. Yeah. There are some points missing. Exactly, so the question is, what exactly are the points in the boundary? And that's sort of a subtle issue, actually. So one can describe it. And uh, I think I'm very happy to say that recently Mateusz, the other lecturer, and Emre, and for who else, Corey, wrote a paper answering exactly this question. I think they took great pains to make the paper very readable. So their question is, it's phased in the context of elimination and implicitization we're gonna come to. But during the break, which will be a little longer today, you will speak with Corey and Amra, and they will tell you what they think about this question. It's a very, very good question. Okay, so elimination is projection. But let's go back, because you're familiar with this in other settings, right? So for example, if you have linear subspaces. So the projection of linear subspaces on the algebraic side, that is on the linear algebraic side, is called Gaussian elimination. Right? If you have a seven-dimensional linear subspace of a 12-dimensional space, represented by matrices as usual, then you will do row operations on this matrix. You'll carry out elimination on the linear equations. That's called Gaussian elimination. But geometrically, this corresponds to projecting your seven-dimensional subspace from 12 space into a nine-dimensional space, for example. So Gaussian elimination realizes the projection of linear subspaces. Now you might work with other geometric objects, for example, convex polyhedra. <coughs> so in the context of uh, convex polyhedra, maybe described by linear inequalities, that's a standard setting in, in optimization. And there's also a notion of elimination. This is called fourier motskin elimination. So if you have a system of linear, in a, so here Gauss elimination pertains to linear equations. This second one pertains to linear inequalities. So if you have a system of linear inequalities and a bunch of variables and you would like to eliminate some of them, there's a somewhat straightforward algorithm that we <laughs> happy to tell you about during the break. And uh, that's called fourier motskin elimination. Okay, and in this case, in our case, we're doing this with nonlinear algebraic equations, and that corresponds to projecting varieties. So let's project a curve. 
So here is exercise one from today's exercise sheet. Um, so I don't know exactly what happened in the afternoon last time, but today in the afternoon I will be here and we're going to do some mixture of exercises from uh, lecture two and some exercises from today. We're going to mix it up a little bit and uh, I have received exactly one submission of exercise solutions so far. Um, so this means anybody else who wants to submit has either not done so or has submitted to Mateusz. So let's project a curve, projecting a curve from three space into the plane. Okay, so you have some curve in three dimensional space like this curve described by polynomial equations. You take a picture with your cell phone and you get a planar image of this curve and it will satisfy some algebraic equation. So this geometric operation of projecting, that is to say taking a picture, algebraically corresponds to elimination. And so in the exercise, um, I gave an example, x cubed, y cubed, z cubed, minus x, minus z, minus y, minus one, and then x to the fifth, plus y to the fifth, plus z to the fifth, minus two. So these two equations cut out a relatively complicated curve in, in three-dimensional space. And the question is, what is its projection into the xy plane? So j is the elimination ideal that you obtain by eliminating z. And you are invited, in fact, you will this afternoon compute the equation of the plane curve. Okay. Now I picked this example because many people who see this kind of example will approach it using high school mathematics. Okay. So if you come here with preparation of high school mathematics, then you'll say, well, this is not so bad, right? Because I can take the second equation and solve it for z. I would conclude that z is the fifth root of two minus x to the fifth minus y to the fifth. So you have an expression for z in terms of x and y, then you will take this expression and substitute it in the left-hand side, and you have a resulting expression in only x and y, so you did carry out elimination, and that will be the high school solution. That high school solution would allow you to draw pictures uh, up to a point in the plane. Here we're dealing with graduate mathematics. We're trying to do this consistently in a scenario that works always. And, uh, so therefore, we're going to learn other methods. But this is a nice example. You can compare the high school solution to the graduate school solution. OK, so that's the elimination ideal. A special case of elimination is called implicitization. Actually, that's true, but I was going to do something else first. <coughs> <clears throat> Let's first talk about lexicographic Grobner bases. So lexicographic So we saw two weeks ago that the term orders, reverse lex and lex are very, very different, right? We saw one example where reverse lex had pretty good behavior, but lexiographic had pretty bad behavior in the sense that it produced very, very large bases and takes a long time. But the pros for lexiographic Grobner bases is that it will carry out the promised elimination for you for free. So it's sometimes costly to compute lexiographic Grobner bases, but just like in life, if you're willing to pay a high price, sometimes you get a good good. So uh, example, let's get towards that. So let's do another projection example. Let's look at the first power sums in three variables. So power sum symmetric functions in three variables. Well, they must be algebraically dependent.
Right? So the power sums, the first one is x plus y plus z, the second one is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and so on. Up to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth. And uh, basic field theory tells you that if you have four polynomials in three variables, there must be some non-trivial algebraic relation. So how do you find it? Right? So what is their relation? What is the algebraic relation among the first four power sums in three variables? So we can phrase this as a projection, that is to say elimination problem, where n is seven and m is three. So we model this by writing the ideal generated by x to the i plus y to the i plus z to the i. Then we tag on a new variable, pi, that's a new formal variable representing the ith power sum, right? So this just specifies that p is a variable and I'm assigning to that variable the power sum. So now I formulated an ideal in seven, in a polynomial ring in seven variables, x, y, z, p1, p2, p3, and p4. Those seven variables are coordinates on a n equals seven dimensional space We've specified a variety of dimension three, cut out by four equations, so we have a three-fold in seven-dimensional space, and now we're gonna project that onto the p-coordinate, so we're gonna eliminate the axis, and this answers the question. So j, and I guess m should be four, sorry, m is four, and uh, we're starting with the p's. So the polynomial ring starts p1, p2, p3, p4, and then the ones we get rid of are x, y, and z. So j, just to mirror our notation, is the elimination ideal. So this is the intersection of our ideal with the subring generated by p1, p2, p3, and p4. That turns out to be a principal ideal, a principal prime ideal. Please practice the adjectives, you know, sing it in the bathtub. Prime, primary, radical, principal, all of these things are just good adjectives to use. So this is a principal prime ideal. P1 to the fourth minus six P1 squared P2 plus three P2 squared plus A P1 P3 minus six P4, okay, that's zero. So if you plug in the power sums, then this is zero. Another way to think about it is by, if you divide by six and bring this on the other side, you have a formula that writes P4, the fourth power sum, in terms of the first three, okay? Now that's not surprising, right? If you know about symmetric polynomials and Newton identities, you say, yeah, I knew that, but the point is you can do this with any polynomials. If I give you a bunch of polynomials and the number of monomials is bigger than the number of variables you're using, this will find the relations. Okay, so as promised, elimination ideals can be computed using lexiographic Grubner bases. So elimination ideals can be computed using lexicographic Grubner bases. Now these Grubner bases, I'm gonna go back now to the notation over here where the variables are x1 to xn, and to make it match the theorem on the left board, I always have to specify the variable ordering and I set it up so that x1 is the cheapest variable, blah, blah, xn is the highest variable. In lex order, the highest variable, xn, is so high, it makes its monomials very expensive. In reverse lex, the smallest variable, x1, is so small, it makes its monomials so very cheap. Fundamental difference between lexicographic and reverse lexicographic. So here, we're using lexicographic. Okay, so any questions? Now I have to raise. 
Yes. Uh, so when you were talking about the risky, the risky topology, the risky topology on uh, K to the N, you uh -huh. implicitly somehow make this identification with the spectrum that we have in. Uh, that's right. So that's right. The definition of the risky topology was originally in the spectrum. And I see. So yes. So what I'm doing here is I'm sort of simplifying the situation. So. In the spectrum, you have this, the topological space is the set of all prime ideals, and uh, then you have a topology on that set. Now here, we're simplifying things a little bit. We don't take all prime ideals. We only take those that are max, another adjective, maximal ideals, okay? So maximal ideals, we shall see, they correspond to classical points. So here I'm working with k to the n, or r to the n, and so if you take this risky topology in the sense of spectra and you restrict to the subset of maximal ideals among all prime ideals, then you get exactly this story. Answer your question? Okay. Okay, so here's the theorem. So suppose G is a lexicographic Gropner basis for the ideal I. So I'm using the indefinite article. Gropner bases are not unique. There are many Gropner bases. So this is just any lexicographic Gropner basis for I. That's a finite set of polynomials. If I take the finite subset that doesn't use any of the high nasty expensive variables, so I simply take the intersection of G with the polynomial subring, I get a finite subset, G prime, and then the conclusion is that this is a lexicographic Gropner basis for the elimination ideal, J, right? So if you have a lexicographic Gropner basis for I, you automatically have a lexicographic Gropner basis for every elimination ideal, for M, for, for M equals one, M equals two, M equals three, and so on. No surprise, it takes a long time to compute that, right? Because you're computing something that's very, very valuable, and you have to pay a price for that. So in particular, if you're in the usual setting of computing reduced Gropner bases, so if G happens to be the unique reduced Gropner base of I with respect to that lexicographic term order, then so is G prime. Okay, let's actually prove this. So proof. So now you can do this, right? So now you can uh, take this ideal, you set up a lexiographic term over where x is less uh, big, smaller than y, smaller than z. You say lex Gropner basis, and out comes the equation of the curve, <coughs> describes the picture. So suppose. F is any polynomial in the elimination ideal J. Well then, by the properties of the lexicographic order, the initial monomial, well, by definition of Gropner basis, then the initial monomial is divisible by the initial of some G in the Gropner basis. Right? So if F is in J, J is a subset of I, so therefore F is a subset of I, and then by the definition of Gropner basis, the leading monomial of F must be a multiple of some leading monomial in the Gropner basis G for I. Well, none, I claim, of X1 up, to, I'm sorry, none of the late variables, X M plus one up to Xn appears in that monomial. Well, why is that? Well, doesn't appear, none of those late variables appears in this monomial. Now that monomial is a factor, but you know, then there's only fewer monomials. I mean, there's only fewer variables, right? So none of the late variables appears here, so it therefore doesn't appear there. Now we're using, for the first and only time, the lexicographic term order by lexicography. These monomials do not appear in G either, right? So G is some polynomial, now it's in the big polynomial ring, right? 
So G is some polynomial. It has a first term, second term, third term, and so on. None of the high variables are in the leading term. But those high variables, they are so expensive that if they were to occur anywhere else, that anywhere else would become the leading term. Okay? So therefore, in the lexicographic term order, if you are a high variable and you're missing from the leading term, you're going to miss from the polynomial. Okay? So it's not in G. None of the high variables are in G. Well, that means that G is actually in G prime, right? By definition, so little g was an element here. We just argued that it's there, so therefore it's in the intersection, G prime. But this implies that G is a Grabner basis. Right? This proves the first statement. Because we just checked the Grobner basis property. The Grobner basis property says that if f is any element in the ideal j, then you know, in that subset g prime, there is some element g whose leading term divides the leading term of f. So therefore, g prime is a Grobner basis of j. End of proof. Now, you can check redudedness. Remember, reduced, and that gives the second statement. So remember, reduced Grobner basis means that uh, the leading terms are monic. Every leading coefficient is one, and none of the then and none of the terms and you know, seeing anywhere is a pro is, oh, okay. none of the trailing terms seen anywhere is a multiple seen of any other leading term, and no leading monomial is redundant. Right, so that's a reduced Grobner basis, and uh, G prime inherits those properties from the corresponding properties for G. Okay, now let's note that you can use lexiographic Grobner basis. We can solve polynomial equations. by elimination via lexicographic Grobner base. I'm going to show you an explicit example. Now what I'm about to show is often not the best method. In fact, often a rather slow method for solving a system of polynomial equations. But if it works, it works. It's a sort of thing that you try first, right? So you have a friend, your friend has startup, you know, and they want to solve some equations for their imaging problem or whatever. If the problem is small, that's the first thing you try. And if you, you know, if that fails, you do something else. But the first thing you try, if somebody gives you a system of polynomials and asks you for the solutions, here's what you do. So example. So let's say I give you a very simple system. Symmetry always makes the discussion nice. So let's say uh, x plus y plus z should be 1, x squared plus y squared plus z squared should be 2, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed should be 3. Okay. The question is, can you find three numbers such that the sum of the ith power is i, for i equals 1, 2, 3? Unlikely to occur as a problem in a startup, more likely to occur on a math Olympiad problem, right? So, okay, so can you find three numbers that satisfy these equations? And, you know, can you find a real solution, right? So maybe you might wonder, can you find three real numbers, x, y, and z, such that the sum of the ith power is i for i equals one, two, three, okay? So then you take these equations, then you calculate the reduced lexicographic Grobner basis, and you find 6z cubed minus 6z squared minus 3z minus 1. Two, so I always underline the leading terms. So the term order here is lexicographic, if x is less than y is less than z, I'm always underlining the leading terms. So 2y squared plus 2yz minus 2y plus 2z squared minus 2z minus 1. In fact, I'm listing them in lexicographic order. And last but not least, 
x plus y plus z minus 1. Okay, so I've transformed the three given equations into a new set, a triangularized set of three equations, and the leading terms are x, y squared, and z cubed. Now, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us, so if we project onto the z coordinate, so if we apply the first theorem from today, from 30 minutes ago, question? Um, why is x the leading term? I, mean, I thought x is smaller. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. Thank you very, very, very much. So actually, in this computation, x is bigger than y is bigger than z. Please check the notes. There's a typo, send me. Yeah. So, so you're absolutely right. So z is the smallest, so therefore this centrifuge called lexiographic Grubner basis will exhibit an xy free polynomial, right? Because x and y, they are so expensive. We want to get rid of them, right? And we found this very nice, cheap little polynomial, 6z cubed, blah, blah, that's only in z. Okay, so now let's think through what this means if n is 3 and m is 1, okay? We have some variety, the variety of all solutions to the Olympiad problem in three-dimensional space, an unknown variety. We're projecting this variety onto the z-axis. That's what m equals 1 does. The image in the z-axis up to closure is the solution set of this equation, right? Because g prime, which is this set intersected with kz, is just this singleton. Right? So therefore, this equation, up to possible issues of closure, is exactly the projection onto the z-coordinate. So therefore, the z-values that run for competition are the roots of this polynomial. Then, so you solve this for z, then you find the possible y-values, and then you find the possible x-values. So this is the first method you try. So if somebody gives you a system of polynomial, the first thing that you do is you look at a lexiographic graph basis. Often this may not terminate, but if it terminates, that's the first thing you do. So now, what we see is that over our algebraically closed field, there are six solutions. So over the complex numbers, this variety consists of six points because there are six standard monomials. Since there are six standard monomials. So uh, for a radical ideal, the number of standard monomials is the number of solutions. So you might have forgotten, that was two weeks ago, what a standard monomial is. So a standard monomial is a monomial that's not divisible by any of the underlying leading monomials. So a standard monomial is a monomial outside the initial ideal. But there are exactly seven of them, there's exactly six of them, right? So the monomials outside are one, y, z, yz, z squared, yz squared, right? There are exactly six monomials that are standard, and therefore there are six solutions. And what are they? Well, since I picked the symmetric instance, there are the permutations of a particular solution. So let me give you some floating point approximations, 1.4, 3, 0, 8, and so on for x minus 0 0.21542 minus 0 0.26471i. i is the square root of minus 1. And then you go minus 0 0.21542 plus the same constant 2647i. Okay, so in the last two slots, you have non-real complex numbers, they're complex conjugates, so therefore this solution and hence all six solutions are non-real. So, so the answer is no. Right? So I've given you the three values whose, that satisfies the equations, but, uh, but they're not real. So there's no real solution to the original question. Okay, let's move on to implicitization. So implicitization is a problem that's a special case of projection or elimination. 
But it's an important special case, so it sort of often gets discussed separately, and that's what we will do, okay? So by implicitization, we will mean computing the image computing the image of a polynomial map. And so now we have a map from m-dimensional space to n-dimensional space. So I have a point in the domain, p1 up to pm. And I simply map it in by evaluating polynomials f1 of p up to fn of p. So I have n polynomials in m variables. That gives me a map from m dimensional space into n dimensional space. And ideally, I would like to compute the image of this. Very good. So that's implicitization. So let's do an example to illustrate the difference. So Let's say m is equal to 2 and n is equal to 3. So let's say we're mapping the plane into 3 space. Right? We're creating a surface in 3-dimensional space that's parametrically given by 3 simple polynomials in 2 unknowns. And the example I'm going to take, so p is a point in the plane with coordinates p1, p2, and here's what I do. I take this to the vector p1, then comma, p1, p2, times p1, p2 squared. Okay? That's my map. Okay? So we all call it x and y, but here I just call it you know, p1, p2. So you have a point in the plane, p1, p2. You map it into three space by sending it to the vector p1, p1, p2, p1, p2, p2 squared. Okay? Now, the image is not closed. Okay, let's first see that the image is not closed. The image is not closed, right? So for example, the point 0, 0, 1 is not in the image. Right? So let's first check. So I claim 0, 0, 1 is not in the image. Well, if 0, 0, 1 were in the image, then P1 should be 0. Then P1 times P2 is 0, and then P1 times p is also zero, right? So if the first coordinate is zero, everything is zero. Okay. But you can check using easy calculus, even if you sit in the last row, you can still check that zero, zero, one is in the closure of the image, right? Because if you take p1 to be epsilon squared, okay? p1 is epsilon squared. p2 is one over epsilon, okay? Plug in. Well then, you know, P1 is, what did I say? P1 is epsilon squared, then this thing becomes epsilon, this becomes one. Then you let epsilon go to zero, and then you get zero, zero, one, right? So zero, zero, one is not in the image, it's in the closure of the image, so therefore the image is not closed, and therefore we need Emra and Corey to help us with the closure. But to do something easier, we can just do the lexicographic Grotner basis, and we calculate the image, the closed image, so this is the variety defined by x1, x3, minus x2 squared. Right? So that's the variety. <clears throat> so the image up to closure is the surface given by the equation x1 times x3 equals x2 squared. Uh, but then closure is sort of a separate issue. OK. Very good. So a couple more words about implicitization. <clears throat> so. Implicitization is a special case. Say implicitization is a special case. of elimination. Well, why is that? Again, that works in every category. That works for linear spaces, polytopes, topological spaces, whatever you like. Manifolds, you know, whatever category you like to work with. Projection is elimination. 
implicitization is a special case thereof, right? Because the graph is in your category. The graph of f is a variety. And it's actually closed, right? So in k, m plus n. Well, how so, right? You're given a list of n polynomials in m variables that specify your map. Now you introduce a new variable for each coordinate on the image space. Okay, let's call the old variables p1 up to pm, just like in the example. Let's call the new variables x1, x2 up to xn. Now, what is the graph? Well, the graph is given by the equations xi minus the ith polynomial in p. Right? Just specifying that xi, the ith coordinate on the image space, is the value of the ith polynomial that does the parameterization. End of story, right? That's the variety, the graph. This is not scary at all. You're very much familiar with this from linear algebra. Right? If the f's are linear, then the images are closed, by the way. So if the f's are limiter, linear, if you have n linear polynomials in m variables, then you can calculate the image, which will be typically an m-dimensional linear space and an n-dimensional ambient space. And you carry out this calculation by Gaussian elimination on that matrix because implicitization is a special case of elimination. Same with polytopes, right? If you have a convex polytope, let's say you have this convex polytope, and you'd like, given by a system of six linear inequalities, suppose you want to take this convex polytope and map it into some other space, maybe some five-dimensional space, or maybe in the plane, right? So you want to take this by a linear map into some other space. Well, you can reduce this calculation to Motzkin elimination by the same trick, right? So the graph will always be in the same category, and this reduces, or typically in the same category, and this reduces implicitization to elimination, and that's what we're doing here in this algebraic setting. Okay, so then once you have the graph, then you can do elimination, right? Then you project it, meaning the graph, into k to the n. So let's see some examples of this, and then we'll take the break. So first example, if m is 3 and n is 4, so that was our example with the four power sums. The four power sums, they gave us a map from k3 into k4, right? That was the map that evaluates, so on the, on the domain we have coordinates x, y, z, and then the map you know, sends it to x to the i plus y to the j plus z to the k for i from one up to four. And we found that the image is a threefold in four-dimensional space given by this Newton equation I wrote down earlier. Okay, that's the first example. Let's see, yes, question. Uh, can you repeat, please, uh, what we eliminate in this implicitization? Okay. So let's say, so, so the statement I made is that implicitization is a special case of elimination. Okay? So suppose you have a curve that's given by a parameterization. So this is a map from the line into the plane. And for simplicity, let's say I have a linear map. Right? So I have a linear map that takes the line and maps it linearly into the plane. Okay, That's the map. Okay? Now how should you think about this? Right? The way you should think about this is you look at the graph of this map. So a function by definition is a graph. So in your very first math class in college or something, right? So your function from A to B, this means you have a collection of tuples in the Cartesian product. That's called the graph, okay? So if a map from R1 to R2, then that map, by definition, is the graph, is a subset of three-dimensional space, okay? So this map is a line in three space. 
called the graph. And now you eliminate. You project it into the plane. Is that clear? Okay. So that's computing the image. Um, very good. Memorable. Let's do a more interesting example. Um, let's do a more interesting example. So let's do the following. Let's take an example where m and n are 10. This is an example I like a lot. So m and n are 10. And we'd like to find something called the Plucker relations. So Humboldt's brother was the first president of the Berlin University. It sort of got going right in the early 1900s. One of the first math professors was Julius Plucker. Right? And so this is named after Plucker. So the Plucker relations are the relations among, for example, the two by two minors. We're going to do this for the two by two minors of a two by five matrix. So let's set this up. So I have a two by five matrix that has 10 entries. Right? So I look at the space of two by five matrices. That's a 10 dimensional space. I map that to another 10 dimensional space by evaluating the list of two by two subdeterminants. Right? So there are five choose two, which happens to be 10, two by two subdeterminants. And I take my matrix and I map it in by making the vector of. I like to calculate the image. So. OK, so we do this by setting up the ideal of the graph, right? So this function that I just described verbally is a variety in 20-dimensional space. Because any map, any function from a set A to a set B, by definition, is a subset of the Cartesian product A times B. And therefore, any map in the 10-dimensional space to any other 10-dimensional space, by definition, is a subset of the 20-dimensional space called the graph. Okay, so the ideal of the graph is zij times z2, okay, z, sorry, 1i times z2j <coughs> So the, the matrix is called z minus z 1j times z2i minus xij. Okay, so, so my matrix has two rows, and those are the z's. And then by xij, I have a new variable coordinate on the image space that gives me the 2 by 2 subdeterminant with column indices i and j. Okay, and I do this for all i between 1 and 5. So this is an ideal in a polynomial ring in 20 unknowns. 10 equations and 20 unknowns. And the variety of this ideal is the graph of the map. So now I'm going to take this 10-dimensional variety in 20-dimensional space and I drop it onto this 10-dimensional target table. Which algorithm should I use? What method would you use to compute this image? I would ask Cody and Emmett. <laughs> Excellent. That's true. So if we wanted the actual, so, OK, so I tell you a secret. This image happens to be closed. But we don't know this. So we don't need these guys. For this one, we don't. In this case, the image will be closed, so we don't need them. So up to closure, what, how do we calculate the image? Well, we use the reduced uh, lexiographic group. Exactly. We calculate the lexiographic group. So we're going to set up you know, a term order. We're going to say, well, these x's, they're really cheap. We like them, right? But these z's are very expensive. We'd like to eliminate. We would like to this dropping of the 10-dimensional variety onto you know, this image space. It can happen. You know, what will happen? Exactly this will happen, right? What will happen is it's 10-dimensional. But the image will be lower dimensional, right? So it can happen that a one-dimensional variety drops to a zero-dimensional variety. This will happen here. So uh, we'll see. Now we're going to eliminate. And then we're going to take the break. OK. So, uh, so the answer, we're going to calculate the elimination. Idea. We intersect this with the subring by the x's. And you see things like x12 x3, 4 minus x1, 3, x2, 4 plus x1, 4 times x2, 3. And then there are four more like it. 
by symmetry. Okay, so what does this say? This is a universal relation, the so-called Plücker relation, that holds among the two by two subdeterminants of a two by four matrix. X12 times X34 minus X13 times X24 plus X14 times X23, that's zero. And by symmetry, you now can take the other permutations or replace the index four by the index five. It will be zero and so on, right? So there are five relations. These five relations generate a prime ideal and the variety of this prime ideal is the image, and in this case, it happens to be cloned. But you're right. If I didn't tell you, you have to talk to them, okay? Now, how should you think about this answer? Let me tell you how you should think about this answer. So I claim that these relations here are so-called Fafians. So these are the four by four Fafians. named after Pfaff, who was also a mathematician, a little bit after Plücker. And they're the Pfaffians of the skew-symmetric matrix. I'm about to write on the left-hand side. So I'm gonna write a skew-symmetric five by five matrix as follows. <clears throat> call this, let's call this matrix X. So 0, x12, x13, x14, x1. So remember, skew symmetric means, so symmetric matrix means the matrix is equal to its transpose. And skew symmetric means it's equal to minus its transpose. So matrix is skew symmetric if you get 0 if you add it to its transpose, right? So therefore, in the first column, we see minus x12, minus x13 minus x14, minus x15. There's zeros on the diagonal in a skew symmetric matrix. Minus x23, minus x24, minus x25, zero, three, four, three, five, and then four, five, and zero, and zero, and x34 negative, x 3, 5 negative, and x4, 5 negative. Skew symmetric, 5 by 5 matrix. Now what is a Pfaffian? A Pfaffian is a principal subdeterminant whose square root has been taken. So by a principal submatrix, I mean a submatrix will use the same row and column indices. Right? So for example here, I have the indices 1, 2, 3, 4, and I take the submatrix with row indices 1, 2, 3, 4 and column indices 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? The determinant of a skew symmetric matrix is the square of a polynomial called the Pfaffian. So if you've never seen this, this, you should learn this, okay? So this linear algebra is full of miracles and lessons one should have learned. And so one of the linear algebra lessons is you should have learned is that the rank, that a skew symmetric matrix of odd size is never invertible. So the determinant of an odd size skew symmetric matrix is always zero, right? For example, the one by one skew symmetric matrix is zero and so on. Um, but for the even, the even size skew symmetric matrices, they're good, they, they can be invertible, but their determinant is the square of an even better polynomial called the Pfaffian, and that's this one, right? So, if you take this determinant, then you get this thing squared. That's the Pfaffian. Now therefore, our variety, which will soon be called the Grassmannian. So Hermann Grassmann, unlike Julius Plücker, was not a university professor. He was a gymnasium layer. He was a teacher. And I think in this area, actually. So if you go around Leipzig, the name Grassmann is quite prevalent, I noticed. So the Grassmannian is the, this variety, and uh, in this case, it's the variety of skew-symmetric five by five matrices of rank two, or oh, at most two. Well, it can't be three, right? Because a skew-symmetric three by three matrix always has zero determinants. So if you have a skew-symmetric five by five matrix, its rank is either zero, two, or four. 
and that's the grass mod, and it's all variety. Here's an exercise. So yesterday I spent all day at the Technical University of Munich. I was a guest of the numerical analysis group of all places. And they were very, very interested in a problem called matrix completion. <laughs> matrix and tensor completion. So here's an exercise on matrix completion. Okay, that's exercise six. And with some luck, we'll get to this this afternoon. So suppose you're given all entries, we continue here, of such a matrix. All entries except all 10 entries, except the upper left and the lower right. So except for x1, 2, and x4, 5, right? So I'm going to not show you this entry, mystery, OK? And this one, you're not going to be shown either, right? You're going to be shown all eight. You're going to be shown eight of the 10 entries. You're not going to be shown x1, 2, and x4, 5. Now, under which condition can you fill up? Under which condition? On the other eight entries, uh, can you complete to rank two? OK, let's say, so I give you eight numbers. Like I give you my eight favorite numbers. So they happen to be 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and 19. You fill in the eight visible entries with my favorite numbers. And then the question is, can you fill this up, the other two entries, to get a rank 2 matrix? That's called matrix completion. Okay. So the exercise asks you to answer this question using stuff you learned today. And uh, here's another thing that, that I like a lot. It's the hyperdeterminant of a tensor. So. I want to phrase this as a geometric question. How can you find the singular members in a family of hypersurfaces? Right? So you have a family of polynomials and that depend on some parameter. And typically, the zero set is some nice, smooth curve or surface. But then maybe for some special values, the thing becomes single. How can you detect this? Let's start with a 2 by 2 by 2 tensor. And that defines a trilinear form or trilinear polynomial. A matrix, of course, one of the reasons we use matrices, rectangular matrices, they represent bilinear forms. So a matrix represents a bilinear form, and a three dimensional tensor represents a trilinear form. So uh, let me write it like this. So x, I'm going to index these 0, 1, so a 3 qubit system. So x, 0, 0, 0, plus x, 1, 0, 0, u, plus x, 0, 1, 0, the linear terms, x, 0, 0, 1, w. So the w, v, u, v, and w are the unknowns, and then these x's are the coefficients. So x, 1, 1, 0, u, v plus x101 uw, and two more, x011 vw, and finally x111 uvw. Okay. Now this defines a surface in three-dimensional space, v of f, right? So if you give me eight numbers, you fill up this tensor with eight numbers, then you know, I have a polynomial in three variables, u, v, and w, and the zero set will be a cubic surface in three-dimensional space. Now, this is a special surface. Typically, this surface will be smooth. And uh, I'm interested in what condition will this surface acquire a singularity. Okay. So this surface will be singular. Well, it's going to be singular at some point. going to be singular at some point, u, v, w, if and only if this tensor, together with uh, these variables, is in the variety given by the partial derivatives. Right? So I'm going to set this up. So I'm going to be interested in f and the partial derivatives, df, du, df, dv, 
and df dw simultaneously vanishing. And this is a ideal in 11 variables. Okay. So this is a typical scenario. So I have coefficients, they're parameters, right? So these eight coefficients, they're measurements and a biochemical reaction network. I'm measuring these x's. And then the u, v, w, those are the concentrations I like to solve for, right, for example. So, so when does this solution set become singular? Well, that uh, these four equations, they specify that the point u, v, w is a singular point on the surface defined by that x, okay? So therefore, to, we need to eliminate the point, right? So we're gonna eliminate u and v, so we take the intersection of i with the uh, polynomial subring given by the eight tensor entries. That turns out to be a principal ideal. generated by the two by two by two hyperdeterminant. And this by definition, whatever you get on this calculation we call the hyperdeterminant. And if you carry it out, so you take these polynomials, you make a term order where u, v, and w are very expensive and x0, 0, 0, 0, x0, 0, 0, 1, x1, 1, 1, 1, very, very cheap. You do the reduced Krupner basis and you find this polynomial. So it's x, 1, 1, 0 squared, x, 0, 1, 1 squared, plus, plus, x, 0, 0, 0 squared, x, 1, 1, 1 squared. So there are four terms like this, then you go four x zero 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 x one one zero x one zero one x zero one one plus four x one 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 x one zero zero x zero one zero x zero zero one, two of those, and then there are six more in a single orbit. There's two x one zero zero x one one zero x 0, 0, 1, x, 0, 0, 1, minus a bunch more, 2, x, 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 1, 0, x, 1, 0, 0, x, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is a sum of 12 monomials of degree 4, and this is called the determinant, the hyperdeterminant of a 2 by 2 by 2 tensor. Now you may not know what a two by two determinant is. And there are many ways to think about two by two determinants. You can use the same definition, right? If I give you a two by two determinant, you don't know what that is, you think about that two by two matrix. That two by two matrix defines a bilinear form, okay? That bilinear form defines, you know, a surface or something, curve, right? That's typically smooth. You write down the derivatives that specify the existence of a singularity, and then you eliminate, and you get an amazing polynomial called the determinant of a two by two matrix. Same definition, okay, for the hyperdeterminant. Now, how do you think about the symmetry? It's actually nice to memorize this polynomial. So, think about a three-dimensional cube. So, the vertices are the binary strings. So, these are the long diagonals in the three cubes. So, in a three-dimensional cube, by long diagonal, I mean you go from one end of the cube to the other end. So 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1. So there are four long diagonals, and there's a typo. Thanks, Tim. Okay, now we have a long diagonal. So also in the last line, there's uh, in the first term, 0, 0, 1 twice. On the last line. We get, I'm just talking about these terms, okay? So these are the four long diagonals. These, on the second line, we have the two fat tetrahedra, right? So if it, the three cube is a, a bipartite graph, right? So the three cube has eight vertices, four are even, four are odd, right? The four even vertices, if you take the convex hull, makes a big chunky tetrahedron cutting right through this thing. And then there's the odd tetrahedron and the even tetrahedron, okay? So here's the odd tetrahedron. Okay, the long diagonals, the chunky tetrahedra, now the last one are the 
um, I will show that the, the squares that slice through, right? So here, um, these four guys, right? So you go, ah, typo again. Sorry, sorry. Now, zero, one, one, okay? So if you're on the four cube, Tim, please check me, right? So these four guys are on a plane and they form a square that sort of cuts through the, tetra the, the, the cube. Okay, let me say this again. A cube has 12 edges. Can we agree on that? A cube has 12 edges. They come in six pairs, right? Every edge has a counter edge on the other side. Each edge together with its counter edge makes a square. That's it, okay? So, hyperdeterminant, um, four big diagonals, two chunky tetrahedra, six pairs of edges. Okay, now let's talk about resultants. Well, can I ask what the singular means here? What, what, what's the definition of singular point? Okay, singular point. So if you have a, if you have a, a polynomial in U, V, and W that traces out a surface in the three-dimensional space with coordinates U, V, and W, and a singular point is a point, U, V, W, that lies on the surface at which, in addition, the three partial derivatives vanish. So singular point means the equation vanishes and all partial derivatives vanish. Just like on the very first page, on the very first lecture in this course where we saw a yellow-red surface, those of us who are here saw a yellow-red surface with four singular points, same thing. So a singular point could be quite smooth, actually. Uh, a singular point. So a singular point is just a point. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, mean, uh, I don't think of a singular point as where it fails to be a manifold. That's exactly what it means. Ah, that's exactly. That's exactly. So, so, it's, so failure to be a manifold means that the, uh, that the gradient, there's no gradient, there's no non-zero gradient vector. But if it is a real variety, can this still smooth that? Yeah, that's what I mean, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say it again. So, from the algebraic point of view, it can be singular, but as a manifold, as a differential manifold, it can be smooth in this. The point. real point. Yeah. The real point. Yeah. The real point. Yeah. This yeah. in this lecture, K is an algebraically closed field. Okay. okay. Now we are in the day and age of data, and this forward-looking institute. Yes. Question. Hmm? Yeah. Can you interpret the coefficients in some way? Do they count some? I mean, you can just take the. Two oh, these coefficients? By two yes. Kind of That's a good question. So, yes. Yeah. So, question how do you do this in general? So, there's a. You can study the coefficients, and there's this book by Gelfan Karpanov Zelovinsky that talks a little bit about this. Anyway, so data science is important, and this institute has a new initiative called Math of Data. So, if you go to this institute's website, then you go math dash of dash data, you get to a beautiful website. And today will be the first ever Math of Data seminar given by my Berkeley colleague, Ben Recht. He is not to be missed, okay? You want to listen to Ben Recht. Very cool guy. Now cool and, okay, now I'm going to say something horrible. Don't tell any, oh, this is going to be on, on I'm not going to say this. <laughs> now I'm going to stop. Now this I'm not going to say. Anyway, Ben is great, please come, okay? And, I'll tell you the horrible thing in the break, okay? <clears throat> okay, results. <clears throat> so, yes? For singular points, the TS, uh -huh. um, how we can, um, the singular points are the points that the determinant of the matrix, which is representing the polynomial, uh, that was in the example on the first lecture. Here the polynomial is simply, you know, a polynomial with eight terms like this, with eight, you know, trilinear terms. Yeah, but the singular points are always the things that's, uh, the determinant is, uh, the rank. Uh, no, there is no, there, there's a, no, there's a priori no matrix. So by singular points, so you have a hypersurface, you have one polynomial and several variables, u, v, and w. Okay. So the hypersurface is the set of points u, v, w where the polynomial vanishes. Among these are some very special points where in addition to the polynomial vanishing, also all partial derivatives vanish. So those are points at which the variety fails to be a manifold. Those are called singular points. 
What are those polynomials that can be written in terms of the determinant of Oh, the this is a wonderful, wonderful question. Let me repeat the question. Which polynomials can be written as determinants of linear forms? Very, very, very important question. Very, very, very important. In semi-definite program, looking around the room, who's the expert? <laughs> Probably the expert. So which polynomial? How can you give a polynomial, say, in the plane, right? Let's say a polynomial curve in the plane. Can you write it as a determinant, for example, of a matrix with some symmetric matrix, maybe with linear entries? So, yeah. Great question. Great question. Okay, results. So resultants are a custom tailored tool to solve special elimination problems. So let's say we're in the situation we'd like to eliminate m variables from m plus 1 equations. Okay? So Grobner bases, lexicographic Grobner bases, they work for any polynomial elimination problem, but because it's so general, often it's not going to terminate. So you need some other tools to address elimination problem. And in this case, resultants are very handy. So if you want to eliminate a bunch of variables from a system of equations where you have one more equation than the variables you want to eliminate, then you use resultants. Let me set up the classical resultant. So for i from 0, 1, up to m, let fi be a general polynomial of degree di in m variables. Okay, so I have m, my m variables are going to be called z1 up to zm, and I take one more polynomial question. Uh, yeah, what's a general polynomial? Okay, a general polynomial, very good. By general, I mean I write down new unknowns for the coefficients. Okay, so I'm going to make one unknown for each. Every coefficient is some unknown, some parameter. Okay, very good. Okay, so I have m polynomials in m plus 1 polynomials. And di is going to be the degree of the ith polynomial, okay? Now, since it's general, it's going to use all the monomials. So let's just record that the di plus m choose m unknown coefficients. That answers your question. So there are this many unknown coefficients. And let's call these coefficients x, i, u, one coefficient for each z monomial, so monomial z to the u of degree at most di, okay? And then, you know, the number of monomials in m variables of degree at most di is the number of ways of making apples and oranges out of a bowl, and that's this binomial coefficient, di plus m choose m. Okay. Now let me write n for the total number of coefficients. So i from 0 to m, so the total number of unknown coefficients di plus m choose m. We have this many coefficients in total. And now let's consider this ideal. Consider the ideal in these polynomials. So this is i now in this discussion is generated by f0, f1, all the way up to fm. Let me choose now the field of rational numbers for the coefficients. So to, to make a calculation, let me assume, so this is now rational coefficients, x bar, z bar, and this is an m plus n variables. Okay, let's make sure we understand what I'm saying, okay? You fix an m, like 3, okay? m is some small number, like 3, okay? So I'm going to make four polynomials, f0, f1, f2, f3, okay? 
Now, to make this, I first specify the degrees. They're like D0, D1, D2, D3, right? They're like five, two, six, seven, okay? So then, to make this polynomial, I take the, all monomials of a, up to that degree, and I put an unknown coefficient, x sub something in front, okay? Now, I look at this in the polynomial ring and all the unknowns, the z's and the x's. So there are very few z's and lots of x's, and I have polynomials whose coefficients are plus one. Every coefficient that I see is one, and they generate the ideal i, okay? Are we on the same page? Okay, so that's my ideal. So then I have the following theorem about this ideal and its elimination ideals. So the elimination ideal So what I do is I take i and I eliminate the few z's and I just get something in the many x's is principal. So this is a principal ideal. So I mean, in some sense it makes sense, right? You have one more equation than you have unknowns, you eliminate the m unknowns from m plus one equations and you get down to one equation. So that's a principal ideal, one generator. Now this generator of this principal ideal is an irreducible polynomial. Is an irreducible polynomial, it's unique up to a constant, in fact, actually unique up to sine if you assume that the coefficients are integer that are relatively prime and then so this essentially unique polynomial is called res f1 f0 f1 up to fm and that's called the resultant okay that's a unique polynomial now that's unique if you specify m and d0, d1 up to dm, right? So then for any such choice structure, you're gonna get a result. Now what about this polynomial? Well, it's gonna be homogeneous in each group of xi, so it has degree d0 times d1 times di minus one times di plus one up to dm in the coefficients of the ith polynomial. So in the coefficients x i u of the ith polynomial. That's the statement of the theorem. So this is the product of all the d's except the ith. Right? So, so I have this polynomial system, so f0, f1, f2 up to fm. Everybody has to completely general, unknown, unspecified coefficient, unspecified measurements, okay, are these coefficients. And now I'm claiming this big polynomial, this amazing big polynomial, the resultant, is very homogeneous. It's, it's homogeneous in the ith group of variables of that degree, okay? Now I'm not gonna give you the proof, but you can read the proof in the graduate textbook of cox loche okay? There's cox loche 1, that's called Ideals, Varieties, and Algorithms. That's the undergraduate textbook. And then there's a follow-up textbook, that's a graduate textbook called Using Algebraic Geometry, and this is proved in the graduate textbook, okay? Now let's look at a case that you know very, very well. So the case that you know very, very well is the case where all the Ds are one. Let's go over this case. So, Example, so there are certain very special resultants called determinants. So pretend for the purpose of this discussion you've never heard of the determinant of a square matrix, okay? So I'm gonna introduce that now. And just to fix notation, so let's say M is two, D0, D1, and D2, everything is one and therefore n is nine, okay? And so why is that? Well, the ith polynomial is x i one z one plus x i two z two plus x i three for i from zero, one, and two, okay? So I have three general linear, affine linear polynomials in z one and z two 
and the coefficients are parameters, x, i, j, okay? So these are the polynomials. So then what am I supposed to do? I'm going to supposed to look at the ideal i, which is generated by f0, f1, f2 in a polynomial ring with how many variables needed does this polynomial ring have? Sorry to put you on the spot. I just want everybody to understand this. I, in this example, is an ideal in a polynomial ring in how many variables? Uh, 11. 11, perfect, okay? Because M is two and N is nine and they add up to 11, okay? So this, I'm in a polynomial ring. This was not planned. So in 11 variables and, well, what's the elimination ideal? <clears throat> Well, you can compute it. While I'm erasing, you can go to your device, type in these three expressions, make the x's really cheap and the z's really expensive, calculate the lexiographic Grobner base, and look at the output. And in that output, you will see some amazing polynomial. There will be a unique, amazing polynomial that's z-free called the determinant. Uh, excuse me, a question. Mm -hmm. If we pick uh, another set of generators for i, then we get a different resultant? No. There's only one i. Well, there's different generators, but I'm defining this i. Okay. So this has a pretty canonical set of generators. Of course, you could, you know. Now, these are my generators. So in a polynomial ring in 11 variables, my generators are x0, 1, z1, plus x0, 2, z2, plus x0, 3, nothing, and so on. Okay, that's my ideal. Okay, so the elimination ideal, and you should try this, so you take i, and you eliminate z1 and z2, you get a principal ideal, and this is generated by the resultant of three linear polynomials and two variables, and that resultant is the determinant of the coefficient matrix. Right? Because the system right, follows from the theorems, right? So we have this ideal, this ideal, you know, defines an eight-dimensional variety in 11-dimensional space. We eliminate Z1 and Z2. We take that eight-dimensional variety, we drop it onto this nine-dimensional floor, this nine-dimensional table with coordinates x, i, j, and this is the equation. Now, geometrically, the way to think about this is that you have three lines in the plane, right? So now if you make your measurements, and so now we go out, we work with the chemist, we make our measurements. Now z, i, j are numbers, right? Now for each z, i, j choice of numbers, so then I have, you know, f0 defines a line in the plane. f1, f2 defines another line in the plane. Now the question we're asking is, under what condition do three lines in the plane meet? Under what condition is it the case that there's a point Z1, comma, Z2 that lies on all three lines? Well, that is the case if and only if the determinant vanishes. Okay, so that's the geometry. Um, let's do another example. <coughs> First nonlinear example. Let's look at the case M equals one d0, d1 equals 2, so therefore n is 6. So how do you eliminate one variable from two quadratic polynomials okay. in one variable? So f0 is x01, z squared with this notation, x02, z, x03. 
And then the second one is f1 x11 z squared plus x12 z plus x13. Okay? So we have these two polynomials with unknown coefficients, unknown measurements. We want to eliminate z. When I ask the question, under what condition do two polynomials in one variable of degree 2 share a common root? Now, if I had asked some of you this question more than two weeks ago, you might not have been in the state of mind of thinking about nonlinear algebra. You might have thought about the high school solution. Okay? So in high school, we memorize a formula that writes z in terms of its three coefficients. And then, thinking this further, you would take that expression and plug it into the second thing. And then you think, and in fact you did solve using high school math, you have a condition in terms of the six coefficients which tells you when these two polynomials have a common root. This solution is okay with two quadrics, but it's not sustainable, it's not generalizable. You have some ugly square roots and you can certainly not do this if the di are five or more. Okay, so, so however tempted you might be, to use high school math, as you transition to be a PhD student or you know, master's graduate student, try to use gradient math. So gradient math, in this case, is to say let's think about F0 and F1 generating an ideal. We calculate the elimination ideal, and then this is a principal ideal generated by the resultant, and this is such an important result and has a name, so this is the Sylvester resultant. And the Sylvester resultant, so this is uh, the resultant of F0 and F1. Now we know from the theorem, from this theorem, we know that this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree 4, right? We know that it has degree 2 in x0, 1, x0, 2, x0, 3. We also know that it has degree 2, this number is 2 in this example, in the second group of variables. There are two groups of variables, and it's going to be quadratic in each group of variables. That's what this theorem tells us. And here's a formula. So this is the determinant of a certain 4 by 4 matrix, x0, 1, x0, 2, x0, 3, 0, x0, 1, x0, 2, x0, 3, x1, 1, x1, 2, x1, 3, and this is x1, 1, x1, 2, x1, 3. So you take the coefficients of the first polynomial, you put them in the first two rows, you take the coefficient of the second polynomial in the second row, you take this determinant, and you get a certain polynomial with seven terms, and this polynomial with seven terms is the result. Okay? That's how you eliminate one variable that appears quadratically in two equations. Okay, so that's our result. Now this is really, really nice, right? What we've done here is we've given a matrix representation using the so-called Sylvester matrix. You asked a very good question. Which polynomials have a determinantal representation? In fact, I'm going to say this on the camera. The best thing that can happen to you if you're a polynomial is if you are a determinant. Right? That's the best thing. Best case scenario for, for a polynomial, this is this crazy polynomial that has it's in six variables, has degree four and seven terms but it's the determinant of a structured matrix. That makes all the difference. That makes this a happy polynomial. So, can we generalize this? Well, suppose this M is still one, but now the degrees are arbitrary. D0 and D1, they're arbitrary, and uh, let's say they're more than five, so the high school solution will certainly not work, right? So D0 and D1 were arbitrary positive integers. We can still form the Sylvester matrix. <coughs> right? 
let me call this matrix Sil for Sylvester, sub D1, D2, uh, sub D0, D1, and this will be a square matrix of format D0 plus D1 times same number of rows and columns, D0 plus D1. And the way you make this matrix, well, you divide it into two horizontal strips, where here you have D1, and here you have, I'm sorry, here you take D1 and D0, and then you put this banded structure, like in the example, where here you put the coefficients of F0, and down here you put the coefficients of F1 in this diagonal banded way. I'm gonna give you one more example. Let's do the case where D0 is two and D1 is four. So, so somebody gives you, you know, two polynomials and the variable you wanna get rid of appears quadratically in the first polynomial and quadratically in the second polynomial. Then you form the following six by six determinant x0, 1, x0, 2, x0, 3, 0, 0, 0. So you take the coefficients of the degree 2 polynomial and you replicate it four times. x0, 1, and you go x0, 1, x0, 2, so the degree two polynomial gets replicated four times, and the degree four polynomial gets replicated two times. Okay, now you take the determinant. That's a polynomial of degree six that will have degree four in the coefficients of the quadric and degree two in the coefficients of the, of the quartic, and that's it. That's a rapid way to calculate principal elimination ideals. Now, of course, you could also use, do this using Grubner basis, right? You could take the I that I described, you can eliminate using Grubner basis, but this is a more rapid way of doing it. And it's more rapid because you have information a priori about the structure of the answer and the structure of the end. The answer is a happy polynomial and happy polynomials are those that have nice determinantal representation. Okay, so the theorem says that the Sylvester matrix does the right thing. So theorem is the resultant of F0 and F1 is equal to the determinant of the Sylvester matrix. Now, how do you prove this? I'm not gonna give the proof, I wanna do a few more things. Um, so to prove this, it helps to know that this polynomial has the correct degree. So by the other theorem, we know the true result has degree D0 plus D1. This thing has degree D0 plus D1, so it already has the correct degree, okay? Now the next thing you show is that this determinant is actually not the zero polynomial, right? So, so for example, you sort of pick, you know, your coefficients rather special, right? So you take your specialized, you make the middle coefficients all zero, and you know, you sort of pick special, then you get the term, this one. You can set it up that this matrix has determinant one, okay? Now this shows the polynomial is non-zero. Now, last thing you need to show that this polynomial is actually in the ideal I, and it's done in the notes, right? So you can take this determinant using what you know about matrices and write this determinant, show it's a linear combination of F1 and F2, F0 and F1. Now you're done, right? It's in the ideal, it's non-zero, it has the correct degree, so it generates the ideal. And that's how the proof goes. Let's do a few things with this, so let me show you how in some situations you can use resultants to do implicitization. So implicitization 
using resultants. Suppose you have a plane curve that's given by a parametrization. So z goes to f1 of z and f2 of z. Okay, and you're interested in the equation of the image. And by this I mean the closed image. Okay. Yeah, so you have two polynomials in one variable, it parametrizes a curve, right? What's the equation that vanishes? Now, that's a very, very useful question, right? Because I might have a curve given by my parametrization. Tim has another curve given by his parametrization, but they might be the same curve. They might be just parametrization of the same curve, right? And I want to extract that feature. I want to know that that's the same curve. And one way to do this is to find the implicit equation. So let's find the implicit equation. I'm going to give it to you. The equation is the resultant with respect to z of x minus f1 of z, y minus f2 of z. I guess these are called zero, oh, that one and two, okay. That's it. That is the equation. Now why is that? Right? That's because the map from the line into the plane is a subvariety, is a curve in three space. That's the graph. Right? Whenever you have a map, a function from some set to some other set, the graph lives in the Cartesian product. Right? So the graph is the curve in three space given by these two equations, right? I'm mapping from the z line into the xy plane, and these two polynomials cut out the graph. But now I need to eliminate z, right? I need to project onto x and y. I'm not going to do this using graph base. I'm going to do this using resultants. So that is the equation of the plane curve. And, and you can try this out, right? Now you, now you have a lot of control, right? Now with this formula, you know you can predict what is the degree, right? Because you just fill this up, right? You just fill this with, um, each of these now will be a polynomial in Z. You know the degrees, so you can predict the degree of the curve, and there's one exercise to this effect, namely the following exercise. Just write this down, so exercise four. So suppose F1 and F2 have degree 10. Question is, at most, how many terms? Does this implicit, do you expect the implicit equation to have? That's useful, right? The data that you're given is two polynomials in one variable of degree 10. So you have 11 coefficients for the first, you have 11 coefficients for the second. Now you eliminate, you calculate the plane curve in the xy plane, but now you get some big, 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 big polynomial in x and y. The question is how big will it be? Okay, so that's the exercise. How big do you expect it to be? Now let me wrap up in the last five minutes, according to the clock over there, with the following important question. What if m is two or more? All right, so this was the case. So we discussed the case of linear equations. We learned that there's an amazing polynomial called the determinant that does the trick. Right? We discussed the case of one variable. We learned there's an amazing polynomial called the Sylvester result that does the trick. So how about if m is greater or equal to two? Are there any nice formulas? For the resultant. Is the resultant happy? Does it in general have a determinantal representation? Well, the answer is sometimes. Okay, and 
There's a very nice book by Gelfand, Kapranov, and Zelovinsky. from uh, 1994 called uh, something like Resultants, Discriminant, and Multidimensional Determinants. And the answer sort of depends. The glass is either half full or half empty, right? So, so if you're a pessimist, then that's, that's usually there are no good formulas, right? That's sort of hopeless, right? There are no simple good formulas for results in general. Now, for me, I'm an optimist, right? For me, the glass is half full, right? In some cases, there are. If you're lucky, those are the cases you're going to encounter in your application. Yeah? So in your application, there's a pretty good chance there is a formula for the result. Okay? And uh, to practice this, one more exercise. Let's try to do some of these this afternoon. Okay? So, so this afternoon, I will ask for volunteers to produce, you know, present some, you know, volunteer to present some solution of her choice or problem of her choice from ring for lesion two. And then if you do that, you're off the hook. Then you don't have to solve any of these real time, right? So if you don't volunteer, I might ask you to do the following thing. Let uh, m to be two and d zero to be one and d one and d two to be two and compute the result. just to get a feeling how big this polynomial is, right? So let's compute this explicitly as a polynomial. In a certain number of unknowns of a certain degree. Well, how many unknowns are there? There are 15 unknowns, those are the coefficients, right? So we have a, a linear equation. It has three coefficients when two variables has three coefficients. And then there's a quadratic equation, has six coefficients, and, and the last one two. So there are 15 x's all together. And the total degree is eight, which is four plus two plus two. Okay, so this is a already pretty big polynomial, right? So it has degree eight in 15 unknowns, but it's still pretty nice. And you can compute it quite explicitly. And geometrically, the question we're asking the following. So you have some physical system where you make a measurement. And your first measurement is a line, the fuzzy measurement, fuzzy line. Your second measurement is a conic. There it is. And your third measurement is another conic. Here it is, okay? Those are my three curves. And the question, do they meet or do they approximately meet? Right? Are they close to meeting? Right? You have a measured line on the plane, a measured conic, and another measured conic. You want to ascertain numerically, using singular values maybe, whether or not these three figures are close to meeting. Well, then, you know, if there were a Sylvester matrix, you'd probably do singular values in the Sylvester, but you can do something, and we'll do it this afternoon. So enjoy the lunch break. I'll see you at 1.30.